My name is Sarah Lancaster. I'm the industry programmer for this year's festival. And thank you for joining us for our next, um, in our Focus On series. We're absolutely thrilled to be able to present um, a panel this year looking specifically at China. Um, definitely there's been so much interest and buzz and uh, talk about this territory. And we really wanted to um, have a, a panel of experts to, uh, to start to break out that conversation a little bit more. So. We're very thrilled in particular to be able to um, introduce you to Patrick Freighter, the moderator for this year, for this today's um, panel. He has, has over 20 years experience writing for Screen International, Hollywood Reporter, Variety, and is now based in Hong Kong where he co-owns, runs, is, does everything for Film Business Asia. So we're very pleased um, to have Patrick here and I'll, I'll throw to you Patrick to present the speakers and today's panel. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, yes, good afternoon, and thank you also to Toronto for inviting us all here. Um, my experience, my recent experience as a journalist shows that pretty much 50% of the audience that I get for, for e the stories we write comes just for the China stories. The interest in China is simply phenomenal. Uh, it's sometimes it's a question of the great unknown, sometimes it's, ex it's exciting, dangerous stories like censorship and things like that. Um, but more, more recently, it, it's to do with the scale of the market and the opportunities uh, that China presents. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We have four very distinguished panelists, but we also don't have a great deal of time. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time doing introductions. There are introductions on the website already, for the, fe the festival website. And I'm going to ask each of them to uh, address a first question, and then hopefully they will kind of introduce themselves as we go along. Um, but you'll find they're pretty distinguished and pretty knowledgeable. But before you find out about them, we want to find out about you. Um, we're not quite sure who this audience represents. I can see some familiar faces. Most of, them, most of you I don't know. Who here has been to China? Hands up. That's good. That's, that's more than we thought. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, well <laughs> So um, my first question, you can answer. No, um, my first question is being addressed to Zhang Zhao, uh, who's sitting at my immediate right. And I'm going to ask you in two minutes to give us a 10-year history of, <laughs> <laughs> of the Chinese film industry and explain how a company like yours, which would not have existed 10 years ago, uh, is now making multi, multi-million dollar pictures. Uh, just, you know, personal stories, I think might make sense and actually I didn't you know I, I start uh, the my professional career in China as a mm, film company boss start from 2005 okay. um, I did my first film produced and distributed my first film in 2006 with Hong Kong company media Asia uh, together with Polygono and that was five years ago and the company was quite successful after five years, was listed as top three you know, in China, private film companies. But when I was experiencing the success and you know, having dinners with the stars and directors and financiers and you know, dis foreign distributors, I turn around, suddenly I find that the audiences are changed. You know, that was, you know, that experience was a shock you know, in 2010, okay, last year, and suddenly I realized there are two numbers. One is we probably have uh, 30 to 40 million moviegoers, you know, theater audience in China, regular moviegoers. Um, so it's it's quite difficult for a domestic film to go over, you know, 100 uh, uh, US dollar million, you know, box office in China. Uh, except a few Transformers and Avatar. Um, but we have 4.8 4 4 uh, 4 uh, 100 million internet users. You know, that's the number that I su suddenly has a you yeah, know, realization. 480 million. Yeah, 480 million. And such a big difference and suddenly realize that, you know, our audiences are so spoiled by the internet. Which also didn't exist in 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 this, that this form ten years. Ten years, ago. yeah, uh, from ten years before, and so that's why I sort of, you know, make my decision. Said I'm going to give up that successful, you know, uh, theatrical 
film company, and I'm going to move to build up a cross media from theatrical to internet, mm -hmm. you know, to to build up the future business for you know on the platform of internet to sort of uh, take care of the audiences that they're so spoiled by the internet. But now you've come full circle, and as an internet company, you are now producing films. Yeah, and so I started a new company this year, the beginning of this year, and basically based on a holding company, which has three parts. One is a tech video streaming technology company that's in Singapore, and the other one is a, a sort of China, uh, Apple TV and uh, Netflix, Hulu combination, uh, listed in China, in mainland China, NASDAQ. And then the other one is my company called Love Vision Pictures. It's focused on taking care of these two emerging markets. One is the low end, mid end theatrical market in China. And then the other one is the, uh, the internet film market. I, th I think there is a market you know, in China. We should call it internet film market. Thank you. Kay. Jeffrey, yeah. I'm, I'm going I'm to sort of pass on to Jeffrey and ask you to help out with the same kind of question. Um, ten years ago, uh, the Chinese film industry was making less than 80 films a year. Now it's making 500 and something a year. Box office in the whole of mainland China, 1.3 billion people, is roughly the same size as Hong Kong, uh, where you and I live. Um, it's 7 million people. I mean, it's, it's changed a lot since then. So, so can, you, can, you, can you help bring us up to the present and what's happened in those ten years? Uh, okay, a couple of sentences about myself. First, I don't live in Hong Kong anymore. I live in Beijing, <laughs> but I'm not from China, <laughs> so uh, I can't say I'm a China expert, and I, I don't believe there's a China expert because the market is changing so fast. Uh, just uh, uh, the ch what the stage of the China market is like, uh, well, it's l more exactly like a 10-year-old boy because the market opened up ten roughly 10 years ago. So uh, it's very energetic, full of energy, growing very fast, uh, and undisciplined, naughty, uh, <laughs> can be mad, uh, uh, mess around a lot. And um, okay, that's China, uh, and um, and it's growing very very fast. And so uh, and as as Zhang Zhou just said. Uh, in less in about less than ten years, it's changed from okay from a, a, a video market, driven market to a theatrical market, and now in a, into a multi-platform or maybe uh, for people working on the internet space, it's an internet-driven market. Uh, so uh, it doesn't may it may not follow all the paths uh, of all the uh, previous uh, uh, sophisticated market development. Uh, it's creating its own path. Um, and so it's really hard. It will be interesting to see how it how it develops. Uh, 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 as I'm partially foreign, partially China, and I, I don't know partially what others. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, there's no, I just read it. There's no uh, no interesting fi film without any risk, and there's no interesting market without difficulties. <laughs> so entering China uh, is not dangerous. But be, be careful. Uh, but uh, I think Patrick ha made me say this because I just <laughs> was teasing. Uh, entering the China market is actually l less difficult, from my point of view, than entering the U.S. market. <laughs> yeah. uh, because U.S. the doors are seems to be open. The market is diff very close, and if you have uh, Sylvester Stallone movie action pictures. I'm sure you've got 50 or 100 Chinese buyer knocking on your door. But if you have Jet Li 3D martial art movies, you got, you got like less than five people knock on your door from the US. <laughs> That's the reality. <laughs> Not uh, even including Mr. Kavanaugh's company. <laughs> Wow, this, this conversation is rattling out of control like a <laughs> <laughs> naughty Chinese boy already. <laughs> Um, but Jeffrey, I mean, could, could just just a, another ten year then ago, ten years ago up to now. I mean, you're a main board director of a Nasdaq-listed Chinese film company. Ten years ago, 
um, the sector was largely dominated by state companies. Uh, maybe you could explain who the major players are in the Chinese market these days. Okay, uh, on the on the tr more traditional space, uh, there will be China Film Group, which is a state-owned uh, distributor, and the other one is called Huaxia, and also state-owned uh, distributor, and filmmakers as well, <coughs> for China Film Group, which they are the only two companies allowed to distribute foreign imported films, including Hollywood blockbusters or international uh, 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 European productions. And there are a few other uh, more established, I would say, uh, 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 domestic or local companies, including Huayi Brothers, Border Film Group, which I'm uh, working, working with, and also uh, Enlight Media, which Mr. Jiang previously uh, uh, was and on in the inter on the internet space there are quite a few others like Yoku and Le TV. They're all listed companies already, uh, and also some game company are getting into that space as well, uh, including uh, uh, Perfect. It looks like Perfect World, Perfect World. Uh, and some others. So these are more well-known companies. But as I said, um, the the China market is growing very very fast. So all of a sudden, then there will be some newcomers emerging and in, in getting into big plays. So you never know. Okay. Isabel, another foreigner. Mike. Um, I wonder if you, you could help us understand, as you are someone who's made a number of films in China, but you are based, I believe, um, in Paris and China Beijing. sometimes. Um, you've, you've worked with uh, art house directors. You've worked on official co-productions and other co-productions, more let's call them co-ventures. Uh, I wonder if you could explain a little bit the the role, if there is any, I, and we hope there is, because this is a panel about opportunities. The role for foreign films, foreign film companies in China. Um, foreign companies in China, there isn't that many actually. There is only uh, the majors are there. The American several. Companies are made with the uh, with America, but the Europeans are not there. So the collaboration are basically made in festivals and markets. Um, for co-production about ten years ago, um, it was mainly money invested in underground illegal films that were traveling to festivals. Um, there was money in Europe, so it was easy to put money on those films and sell them, which is not the case anymore. So that's why. Official co-production are becoming a very important stage in the collaboration with China. Um, I'm myself the producer of the first Chinese French co-production, which we're screening at uh, TIFF, which is called Eleven Flowers. And that helps uh, get money in France and in China. Um, but in the same time, there is a lot of money in China. So for co-production, they are not really expecting money from the West, uh, except for our house directors sometimes. For foreign films that want to go to China, it's sometimes more complicated uh, because of the censorship, because of the lot of uh, issues in finding the right partner. Um, producers in China are not exactly the same way than producers are in Europe. Uh, very often they are rather investors than producers. Um, there's also one important collaboration possible, it's actually international sales. Um, there isn't that many international sales in China. Company often do sales themselves. And uh, there, there's the need for the Chinese to have international sales. For example, the film that just got the Best Director Award in Venice, uh, the director just arrived in Toronto, they don't have international sales. He's just here with his Chinese investor speaking. To <laughs> you're talking with him? I, he can hear you. I, you you're ready to <laughs> do it. Y you're willing, yeah. <laughs> Everybody. We're going to start the bidding. 10% anybody? <laughs> <laughs> when, I, when I arrived two days ago, all the international sales were asking, was the director, he's just here. I bump into him and he's saying, oh, I have a lot of people contacting me now. I don't know who to work with. <laughs> he's not prepared. <laughs> but, but Venice is gone, so usually they need, they need partners before going to Venice. So that's one of the, also, the way to work uh, between China and international companies. Uh, and you're not a Hollywood player, but I wonder if you as an observer could tell us a little bit about how you see the Hollywood companies having worked in China over the last 10 years. Um, they were great in the sense that they, w 
moved to Beijing and they try to uh, have very strong relationship with uh, local companies, Taiton, or they tried a lot, but in the last 20 years, um, the import quota stayed the same. So collaboration was complicated and the only way possible to move forward into the market was actually to put money into the films. So they tried on several uh, Lutran film, for example, Missing Gun, Kakasuli, where Columbia was co-producing. Uh, but now he's moved on, he's made bigger film, and it's financed by Chinese company. He doesn't need the Americans right. anymore, except for the sales, and that's where Wild Bunch is there for Europe, and, and so there's still that need. But there's more uh, eagerness from uh, American company to come on board to do products or films that will fit the international market because it's also a problem. There's now a real industry in China, or it's starting. It's a 10-year-old kid, but it's, it's growing and it's getting older. Um, but very often the films that are made in China, even with a big budget, when it's not a co-production with Hong Kong, those films are difficulty traveling. Even Tianwen, last film that was the number one um, at the box office last year in, in, in China, a few company um, bought it for distribution abroad, but I don't think it would be as big. It's impossible. The film is very local. So in that sense, the American company and the collaboration of co-production are trying to make those Chinese films being able also to travel more. And, th and that's a hard task, you're suggesting? Uh, it's very difficult because I would say the Chinese audience is very different from our audience. They don't have the same relationship with the character, with the story. And so somehow in the, the drama or the script, the way they tell the story, um, there's less emotion. Uh, we say the Western audience identify with the character on the screen. For the Chinese, it's more the experiment of the story. And what is told, is it, it's true. They, they don't have a certain distance with it. Like just for two hours, I'm, I'm dreaming that I'm a superhero. It's, it's like, like that. So, for example, for John Woo, uh, one of John Woo films, uh, there were so many characters that they would have the name on the character on the screen to, to, I don't, to make sure you would know who is that guy who just arrived. So there's not the introduction scene to say, okay, the guy is an emperor, is that kind of... No, you put his name, all the Chinese audience know the guy, it's a legend. So, okay, his name is enough to introduce a character, which for us, for an audience, it's, we're lost with those names we can't even really read. And therefore that has a different way of storytelling. Yes, yeah. there is, definitely. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's uh, three people. Ryan, I suspect you are the better known person to North American audiences, but um, uh -oh. you've just done, you've just, you've just done a, 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 a Chinese deal with a state-owned enterprise, which you think is significantly different to what other companies have done in China. Um, talk us through this. Sure. Well, I, I actually think I'm, all I can really do is take a kind of consolidation or corroboration the other three panelists said and kind of put it together. Yeah. You know, I'm the 10-year-old boy that showed up <laughs> in China. <laughs> so you can be best friends then. <laughs> exactly. Um, and if I knew we could wear Converse, I mean, come on. I would have <laughs> worn my damn Converse. Um, no, uh, the, uh, the, the truth is that, that everything that I've heard here, I couldn't, couldn't be better described. You know, for me, I started my experience in China in 2004 with a movie called Forbidden Kingdom, which was the first time that Jackie Chan and Jet Li were in a movie together. And we signed a contract with a very large, well-known private company who owed us $6 million. And every day that the money was supposed to come, it didn't come. And then the next day it didn't come, and it didn't come, and it didn't come. And we had this great letter of credit from a Chinese-owned bank. So of course, we called up the Chinese-owned bank and said, you guys owe us some money. And they said, no, we don't. And they said, well, we have a letter of credit from you. And we said, well, that means nothing. <laughs> so we learned very quickly <laughs> that, um, that ch doing business in China is very different. And ultimately, uh, someone brought up the Way Brothers who have had a very successful IPO. We found a partner in, at the time and someone called the Way Brothers. We were their first movie and within three days we had a deal done and they, 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 they sent us $6 million. Um, that was a Chinese co-production that we shot in China and we collaborated very closely with people in China. Shoot to, I don't know, a couple of years later, we did a movie called Spy Next Door with Jackie Chan and figured, hey, we should get something similar. It's Jackie Chan, we got $100,000. Um, so we learned that there is a process in China that is unknown. Um, and I'd say the difference between what I've learned personally and, and probably what the other studios have done is, um, you know, China obviously is a very big place, you know, with, with 1.3, 1.4 billion people, depending on who you ask, with a box office that's grown from, you know, 100 million to a billion and a half dollars in a matter of years. 
um, 6,000 screens growing, you know, three, four, five a day. Um, probably the most promising market there is in, in, in the world, and yet it's, it's, it's being protected. And people don't understand that protection, and I don't think that the people who are protecting it understand the protection. What they know is that we as Americans come into places and we come in bulldozing with our guns blazing and horses going and just try and you know, gut it and make it as big as possible and then we move on. And what China, I think, is trying to do is keep that from happening because China, unlike the US, has a ton of culture and a ton of cultural history. <laughs> and it's true, we don't. We're, we're a brand new country with very little culture. And so it's very, our culture is not that important to us. It's just a fact of American way. Whereas the culture of China is part of their blood. And so they have a, a true fear, I'd say, that Americans are gonna come in and, and harm that culture. And so part of the idea of having you know, a censorship bureau and, ha and the idea of having you know, someone who's gonna review your scripts and someone who's gonna decide whether you're a co-production is make sure that you're treating China not just rightly, but in a manner in which you're honoring that culture, which has become such an important way of their life and has been an important way of their life for five, you know, 10, 15,000 years. So um, what we've done and what I did a little differently was I, every studio has been out there for years. And if you drive down the street, you can see, I'm not gonna name by studio, but studio major A building, you know, with 5,000 employees and building B with 6,000 employees and building C with 12,000 employees and yet they've not made a dent. So I flew out alone with an assistant and went right to the government and said, here's who we are. I'm a 10 year old boy. You're a 10 year old boy. And let's figure out how we can work together that as 10 year old boys, we can both do the things that we'd like to do and, and help each other. And that's basically what we did. We formed the first um, ever state joint venture with one of the two state companies that uh, my colleague mentioned, which um, most Americans pr pronounce uh, Huaxia, but uh, it's H-A-U-X-I-A. And um, they are one of the two groups that are effectively responsible for quota in China. And what I've learned is that the China market is very open. It wants to change, it wants to grow, and it wants new products. But it wants to make sure also that it's not doing it at the cost of the culture of China. So what I've seen is you hear all these rumors of, oh, well, there's only 20 slots. Well, there's not only 20 slots. There's 20 slots for actual movies that have been finished that the government is gonna allow for either Waxia or the China Film Group, the only two state-owned companies, to look at and decide, you know what, we're gonna actually make this a movie that will revenue share with someone in the United States. And that incentivizes people in the US to make movies that generally treat China right. Beyond that, there's another 50 slots that most people don't know about that are totally available, that anybody from China that is a, you know, either through the China Film Group or, the, or, or Waxia can walk in and say, we're gonna buy that movie and we'll pay you a fee for it. And then there's an open market, which is a co-production market, and there's no quote on it, which is, hey, if you show up to China early enough with your product and you work with us, the government, you can make whatever you want with our permission. And people don't recognize that that exists because they come in guns blazing and most of the other studios have set up you know, very tall, very robust infrastructure saying this is how we make movies, this is how we distribute movies, and this is how it's gonna be done. We went in and said, how do you do it and how do you wanna do it and let's follow your way. So we did announce the first ever partnership with a, a government entity. Um, it's an incredible partnership. Um, we already have, I can't say what it is yet, but our first movie is in production um, and we'll be announcing it in the next two or three weeks. Uh, we intend that all of our movies will be going through um, this joint venture and we kind of are setting up a platform that we hope all studios will use. And the idea is that China isn't really a place because of the way it works, because of the way that theaters work with Waxia and China Film Group and because of the way that, that the censorship bureau works and the, the black market works. There's not really that, even though it's such a big place, that much room for 20, 30, 40, or 50 different direct distributors. There's two distributors. There's China Film Group and Waxia, that's it. Everybody goes through them, no matter what agent you are or sub agent or you know sales agent that's who you ultimately are touching even if you don't know it so at the end of the day our goal is to kind of be the the liaison or bridge if you will for all the studios who we've had many partnerships with and financial partnerships and co-finance partnerships and production partnerships and help to lead them through an appropriate path that keeps china happy and keeps them happy um and i'll just close by saying that uh 
you know, I couldn't be more pleased that the group that we were their first movie, the the Way Brothers. I think I just IPO'd in China for what is it, two billion dollars, mm -hmm. um, which is obviously very exciting and shows there's a lot of growth. Um, and that uh, we announced uh, the first actually China-owned company where we actually even an American company can have ownership in China called Skyland, which is a partnership with um, SAIF and IDG, which are the two largest privately owned hedge funds, along with Waxia. And the goal is by having very large venture capitalists that are Chinese-based, the government involved, and kind of, you know, large content involved that we can help to shift the China, or actually, let me reverse that, help to shift the U.S. market to understand the China market better. Because the China market wants product. It's more than happy to have the product as long as it's done right. And I think one of the things you're saying, and, and I'm throwing this open to all of, all of our panelists here, is that it's very easy to for foreign companies, foreign people, foreign people looking into China to obsess about things like quotas, censorship, piracy. But what you're saying, and, I, and uh, anyone can join in here, is uh, is that there are so many other things to, to, to focus on. Um, those things are to focus on the negatives, but there are a lot of positives to go for as well. And I wonder if some of you could pick up on that idea as well, that, that China is, is a place where you can do things. I'm happy to continue unless I go across to the scorpion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think the microphone. There you go. Yeah, I mean, I actually, uh, uh, you know, that was great to hear that uh, uh, from my standpoint because I was educated in the United States and been making films here, then going back to China uh, to open up my own business and being proved that uh, if you take care of the audience right, eventually you will have a success. Okay, now how do American uh, studios, mini studios, and you know, like uh, uh, independents, how do uh, how do we access the market? I think I said it to somebody yesterday. I said the three things. One is the willingness. Are you really willing to put a lot of effort in market? I mean, it's a huge, gr fast growing market. If you really put an effort, you know, I don't think you need to put more effort than you making a film in the United States. You know, I, I think, uh, yeah, but you do need to put an effort. Two, it takes creativity. You know, the political issues, the censorship issues, the finance issues, and, you know, uh, they are all needs a lot of creativity, you know, to to get around with it. You know, that's the difference because, you know, it's a 10 years, you know, 10 years boy, and in China, um, you know, when you work with a 10 years boy uh, to do whatever, it takes creativity. You know, you need to solve a lot of problems in a creative way, okay? And same as to to make the story work for the local audience. And third, of course, mathematics. Now, how uh, I always say that, uh, yeah, of course, it's a, if it's 20, you know, like studio films, like Transformers or whatever, or Avatar, th those kind of films, you don't have to worry about how to market the film to the audience because they already have a huge brand in China. You know, all the audiences, they recognize that's a brand. So it's a lot easy to do, even for, you know, the, the distributor of China film groups or Hua Xia. But if it's a new brand, and if it's something creative, interesting, if you want it to, to be the future, then, you know, how to market film becomes crucial. Uh, I think, especially for co-production films, because you are taking two markets, you know, you, you're supposed to, okay, uh, paying a lot of uh, effort into how to market film and how to pay, uh, you know, put a lot of effort. You never, there's no free lunch. You want a w one big market added on a project, of course you need to pay, yeah. you know, to pay a lot of effort into it. Yeah. Brian, you're itching to answer. Oh, I was just going to say, you know, I, th I think one of the problems and probably one of the reasons we have so many people in the room is that, that China is a little bit of, a, of ex and excuse my, 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 my pun because it's going to be the opposite, but it is a little bit of the wild, wild west right now. You know, that you hear about a lot of money coming out of China. Every day we have announcements that this guy got 100 million and that guy got 500 million and this guy got 200 million. And so all of a sudden it's kind of like what the Abu Dhabi was of seven years ago when, you know, you, you asked where your friend was and he was in Abu Dhabi getting money for his movie. Um, and that's kind of how it feels a little bit in China right now. And the truth is that it's somewhat right and somewhat wrong. What I mean by that is, is that you're not going nobody that I know of is going out to China and coming back saying, "Hey, I found ten million dollars for my movie." 
But China is willing to pay. They are a very fast-growing market. They've got a very big middle class. They've got a lot of capital. The government is well capitalized. And there are opportunities that, in some instances, you wouldn't be able to get elsewhere because China wants access. So to such as what? What's that? Give me an example. Well, you can probably get, if you created an appropriate co-production, meaning a, a movie that, um, and I don't want to use any specific names, but a movie that China would view as something very positive for them, you could probably get economics that are much better for you. Even if the movie is a worldwide you know, type of film, you could probably get them to pay for more than 50% of the movie, even if China only represents 8% of the film. The reason being that it's very good to help promote you know, China and the China film business, meaning if you shoot there and you show the world, hey, what a, what, this is a great place to shoot, we have great crews, and you take care of them in terms of their culture, those things are available to you. Um, they're available to you through the correct route. But what I would say is there's not, just like there was never in Dubai, just like there was never in Abu Dhabi, just like there was never in Bahrain, there's not all this, you know, people running around with briefcases of cash saying, oh, you've got Robert Redford in your film, here's $10 million. It, it just, it doesn't happen. And what, what China is looking for and China is open to, still sensitive, but really, you know, I'd say the most important, are people who want to create long-term partnerships that will grow their business and take care of China at the same time. And the reason that censorship still exists and the reason that um, that uh, quota still exists is purely to make sure that their market is not cannibalized and destroyed, frankly. You know, they have a culture to protect and they want to protect it. And I think that they're being very cautious in the partners they're, protect they're, p they're picking. And um, so I would say one other thing I just want to add on in the marketing is there, there, a couple people talked about the marketing. The biggest challenge is there is not marketing like we have yeah. here. You don't flip through your TV and every day see a you know, trailer for the movie that's coming out. Um, there's a reason that print media is growing at 30% a year in China. When we have you know, print media here, we all know what's happening. You know, Internet basically decides what happens to a movie, as was referenced earlier. You know, here, we don't know what the Twitter effect is. Does it grow a movie? Does it not? I, th that is all that causes a movie to work there. If just they have the equivalent of Twitter, if it says it's great, everybody goes. If it says it's not, nobody goes. Mm -hmm. Um, and one of the most brilliant things that I can tell you that I've seen, and it took me back to my childhood, and it's one of the reasons that I'm spending you know, a week or two weeks a month in China, uh, is walking up to one of the bigger theaters in Beijing or Shanghai and seeing a line you know, kind of three blocks around that is for the new movie that's just come out, whether it's Avatar or you know, Inception or you know, even a local you know, s a snowflower or a local movie. And those, are, those days just don't exist here. And if you remember, the market was relatively small here at the time and has grown. It shows you the amount of, gro of room for growth. And I think there's going to be a number of agents of change. Yeah. And if you're willing to be one of those agents of change and you're willing to follow along and make China feel good and at the same time take care of them, I think there's a huge opportunity there. That's great. Um, let's talk a little bit more about co-production specifically because that seems to be the the government and the government response to to issues that which are brought up about quotas and so on it's like okay the quota the quota is not going to go away it seems very soon but why not come and co-produce anyway um, is that going to change the films that are being made is, is this the is this the right response Jeffrey what do you mean you mean the uh, the uh, actual co-production yeah. Uh, you mean what? Uh, how it I think it would affect the, the f uh, well. This is my my view that uh, I think it was at, it's only the beginning now. Uh, uh, back to the question whether okay uh, whether things can be done in China. Yes, otherwise I won't be living in Beijing <laughs> 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 because I originally I, I grew up in Hong Kong. I, I work from Hong Kong. Yeah. Do you have, do you have some property to sell. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's not co-production. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's an investment. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think uh, it's the key is you, you need to spend time to understand how the Chinese think, how, what they want to do with the Chinese culture. Uh, you're not just going there and get hoping, hoping that you can get money immediately out of it. Uh, and back to the co-production issue, I think if in the longer term where we have more agents to help the China market to develop and grow, I will see there will be some type of uh, uh, new types of movie where we actually target not just for the U.S. and and China, maybe the rest of the world, but 
that's of course what takes time to, to happen. Uh, I'm gonna add just one thing on there, I'm sorry. Go on. I'm, I feel like I'm hogging the mic and I, that's because I am. I'll cut you off, um, don't worry. But uh, one thing I just want to say on that is, and it reminded me of, yeah, one of the most important things that I've heard from all the way up to the highest forms of the China government is that they're looking for movies that aren't, hey, we want a movie that's gonna work in China. They want a movie that's gonna work in China and work around the world. But that's, you know? but that's precisely where I'm leading with this question. I'm glad you picked that up, but there haven't been many that have worked yet. Well, where th are they going to come from? That's not I actually Isabella, true. Isabella, are you going to be making those films? That, that's not actually it, true, though. I, I mean, y you know, if you look at where they started from, sure, they might not have been Chinese co-productions, but you know, whether you take, and I'm going to take really big movies, so you're going to laugh, but whether you take movies you know, like an Inception or like an Avatar, they, they broke $100 million in box office. There's only 6,000 theaters. That's one-tenth the theaters we have in the United States, and they did $100 million mm -hmm. there. So my point is not that, oh, we should make all American movies and put them there, but that there is room for movies that will play very well in China and play very well in the rest of the world. We just haven't yet tapped into it. So imagine right. if Avatar or Inception was a little more of a Chinese-based myth that you know took put Chinese characters in it as well as American characters. You don't know, maybe you're not gonna do a billion dollars, but if you can do $200 million worldwide and get 30 million in China box and 50 million in domestic box, you've got a really successful co-production and that's right there for the picking. But among the cooperation that have been made, I mean, if it was um, the children of Huang Shu, um, there was the White Hunters, uh, Painted Veil, they didn't work on the Chinese market. So well th there's, when, when you have Chinese actors, so that's probably one of the problem in co-production is sometimes produce a foreign producer arrive in China with their own project and then don't take the time to try to see what is the Chinese audience because something that you think might work in China, if you're not careful or not, if you have Jackie Chan and Jet Li, you might I was gonna say our co-production, we made a lot of money on that. But <laughs> you know more China. <laughs> you know more China than many producers that go there. So it, it takes time to really understand and try to find the right subject for the two markets. Well, well, uh, and I think that, the, uh, Jerry, I'll yeah. shut up in five seconds. I was just saying, <laughs> I, okay. I think that that's one of the biggest issues that I've seen is when you go out there and you meet with people or ever since we announced our China, you know, deal, I get 50 emails a day, a day of scripts for China. They're very, very, very traditional Chinese stories, which are generally very interesting, but they're extremely traditional, extremely Chinese based, and most of the world wouldn't understand them. And so they say, hey, I've got this great Chinese co-production. And most people in the government who are more traditional than you would expect would read it and go, that's a great story. It's totally a perfect thing for China, and it will work in China, and it won't work anywhere else. And so the goal of a good producer, I think as we're here on the panel, is to find a story that will work in China, that yeah. the Chinese government's gonna say, we like it. That at the same time, the US and the rest of the world will also say we like mm -hmm. it. Well, I think, um, you know, what uh, Relativity Media, you know, it was uh, successful on the, you know, a few co-production issues, just because they find the right partner. You know, that's really important. Uh, you, you as a foreigner, you go into a country and, and, and try to understand the culture and the market, take you five years and five, five you know, flops, right? If you find the right partner, you could, you know, make money, you know, three out of five, you know, which is a pretty good ratio. And, and so I think, um, you know, we, we, we're gonna, you know, probably announce uh, a few big, uh, films that coming from United States, okay, and one is Chinese story, uh, but we will find the U.S. directors and the U.S. writers to to do the narratives and do the scripts, and then you know work with the U.S. studios and you see if. Uh, but can I just ask you, is that an, a China originated project? Yes, and you know there are tons of materials, you know, in that's an important story stories in China that uh, you should be able to make it into a studio blockbuster. I think, can, yeah. can I just point out, I think you guys are talking two different things actually, mm. and maybe I'm wrong. There's a lot of story that are China originated stories that have been rewritten that are still about China and still have the China you know, um, heart of it, but written and known in the English language. So there's many, lots of books that are being rewritten about the Chinese you know, uh, whether it's fairy tales or fables or stories or, or wars or, you know, fights that exist that we all know. And, and, and a lot of those will make great movies. And it takes, you know, it takes you bringing up to a high concept. 
you know, to make it a high, high concept film. I mean, not a, I, I, you know, if you wanted the film, the story to be traveling, you know, around the world, it has to be high concept. Everybody understand that, you know. And then if it's independent film, you know, Isabel, you just mentioned those films, and that takes a lot of marketing effort, you know, globally. If I, any independent films is like this, right, in the world, I mean, <laughs> there's no exception on that. Yeah, and also the other, the third thing is, if you have a great, say, I believe that Transformer Three is going to be like Panda Two, mm -hmm. you know, and they're going to adapt it into a more Chinese uh, narrative, okay, more elements into it, Chinese culture. Mm, uh, Expander Two is uh, Panda Two is extremely successful in China, but a little bit less in in the world, right? It's it's, it's all about mathematics. Do you want to say anything more? Yeah, ju just one thing is I think the way foreigners see China and the way Chinese people see China are two different Chinas. Yeah. And if you we don't agree on the white of China that will be on screen, then it's impossible to have a film that would travel. So the Chinese are trying to learn to understand how we see China and what is possible for us. And in the same time, we have to learn because, I've, for example, I've been with uh, uh, European producers going to China. They had project which was about Chinese with Chinese characters and Chinese culture. And they will meet with Chinese producer, and the Chinese producer will say, "It's great, perfect for you guys. <laughs> I mean, yeah. finance it. It's it's yeah. for you guys. For us, I mean, come on. This is the old China. China today, it's not bad. Yeah. But you don't seem to be ready to see China today. So okay, keep on doing your films, but finance it. Don't expect us to to right. finance the vision you have of China. Right. Right. But I think also one thing that's key that I've found is is there is still a very big cultural divide, and you have to be. Um, very, very uh, sensitive on the cultural divide, whereas the people on the highest levels of the government, because it's generally family-based, still maintain, rightfully so, a very, very strict sense of this is what China represents and this is how we're going to do it. And most of them don't speak English on that level or speak limited English on that level. And so when you're walking in, even if it's a Chinese project, if you don't handle it appropriately, and I think someone brought up having the right partner, you don't come in with the right partner who has the relationship to say this is why it's a good Chinese co-production. No matter how good that story is, it's not going to get made. Right. Okay, I've, I've had all the questions. Jeffrey, you Okay, want to just to add to follow up Then we're going to go Isabel. for questions. In uh, there's the a great, still there's a great cultural divide between all the, the tastes and preferences of different markets of the audience. And at the same time, uh, uh, actually, uh, Ryan pointed out, there's also a perception or a divide or concern, different concern about what the Chinese audience want to see and what the Chinese government want to be made. So you need to tackle all these three at the same time. So the okay, the, uh, uh, to find the right project and the right partner, that's the key, but it's not easy. <laughs> Ju just one little thing is there, among the cup production being made in China, about 80 to 90% of the cup production are Hong Kong China cup production. So the guys that really know how to do cup production are actually Hong Kong people. They know more the market and the people. But, but, but it's after 10 years. Yeah, you well, know? in the next I mean 10 years, <laughs> we'll see. We'll, 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 so we'll be working it on it. It takes 10 years. <laughs> okay, I'm not, I don't I hate to interrupt, but I'm going to throw this open to some questions from the audience. There's a chap here, but we can, can you wait for a microphone? And then they'll take one more over there. I'd like to just bring up a very you know, interesting and important case study that I'd like to get your take on, which is nothing less than the most successful Chinese uh, film made so far, uh, Let the Bullets Fly. I was shocked that this movie made so much money because when I watched it, um, you know, the content is so potentially, it could be read as subversive. Uh, I think you know, a lot of discussion on, online about how the film is kind of this veiled critique of government corruption and you know, such, a, such an incredibly darkly humorous film. Uh, and then the fact that it was released by the, s you know, passed by the censors, I find just amazing. So I wanted to get your take on what a, f what the success of a film like this means in China and how, you know, what kind of indicators that gives you in terms of what's allowed to be made in China. Well, and you know, sometimes people get confused because I'm from a marketing background. <coughs> I mean, I, I assume that if everybody is <coughs> sitting here are filmmakers. And when you're f looking at it from a marketing point of view, and you know Feng Xiaogang's film, the number one film director in China, you know we're not selling stories, okay? And we're selling the brand of the director. You know whatever film, you know I I don't know. I mean it could be uh, John Wen is 
you just the film just mentioned, Let's Blue Fly. Of course, it's an entertaining. Okay, there's a lot of a sub context about the story that, uh, uh, which is uh, very interesting. I don't think that anyone they don't know Chi Chinese history for for the last fifty years. They will appreciate that kind of humor. Okay, and then we're setting the brand, uh, setting the stars. It's not really selling the narrative. Now anything that, that's what I was saying. Uh, it, this is not high concept. So it's a better saying that. Uh, uh, the the Chinese audience is very aware of directors as well. Uh, yes, he's an extremely big star. It's like, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger is directing a film. A film saying, and then it has a lot of American humors in it. Of course it's gonna play w well in, in America, but I don't believe that will play but well in China either. To, to answer the question specifically about um, how did this subversive film get through the censors? <laughs> I think, I, just real simple, and I think one of what I'll say is, I think that the censorship committee is opening up more and more and more to realize that by just cutting out anything that they don't like or that's anti-Chinese you know, Chinese sentiment isn't the right way to make China look the best to the world. I think they're realizing that the best way to make China look the best in some cases might even be to allow it to make fun of itself a little bit. Yeah. Might even be like we as America I, do. I'd love to hear yeah. you have that conversation. Yeah, but, but it's <laughs> okay. Um, but there, there I've, yes. I've had it, but I've had it. I and, wish, and I wish there's I was a little bit difference. Well, um, you know, just well, like I think if, uh, let me uh, answer that question because yeah. I, I'm dealing with, with it Kong. all the time. Yeah. <laughs> all the time. Uh, so I think uh, the censorship issue is not okay. It's not like other like censorship uh, uh, in the rest of the world where, okay, you can read the the, the, the rules and regulations and then and so the, the censorship issue. Which, is which rules and regulations? Uh, in in China, is that it, it, it <laughs> my experience in the past ten years is it's more like waves. I think that at this one point the Chinese government really understand they need to open up more to have allow more subject being being filmed. But at the same time, I think China has its own, uh, all kinds of different uh, issues that they need to be very careful with. So it's more like, okay, you progress three steps and then you step backward. So it's, okay, for that particular film, I think uh, there are many, many, many reasons that it may have, have passed censorship, but it was at least one at the time where it's trying to make three steps forward. Well, I think, I just want to add one second on that. I just wanted to say that the key is, too, for the first time ever, the China censorship is allowing people in the room. So they'll allow that director to come in and say, this is why I want this to pass and why it's good for you. Before, a script went in a room, and you either got passed, didn't pass, or here's your new script to shoot. Yeah. <laughs> but so the next question was over here, I think. Or is this there? I can't see very well here. In that case, can we get you a microphone? And then we'll go over here. Okay. Whatever. <laughs> we'll follow the microphone. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. I'm Leonardo uh, from Italy. As you know, Italian, we were really fascinating about uh, Chinese culture since Marco Polo. So, <laughs> <laughs> actually, I have to tell you guys, we were the first. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, now, a silly question to this interesting panel. Uh, do you think that co-writing in a co-production could help? That's all. I think that, you know, it's, it's uh, I, I always say that, uh, you know, I mean, of course, I'm putting money into uh, U.S. films and the studio films are trying to choose the run and then to pass the censorship so I can sell it, you know. But really, I think f uh, from last year, I always said it every panel, I said, please, let's start co-develop stuff. You know, that's the way to, to make everybody easy. You know, otherwise everybody's so nervous about oh, what the, the regulation is that, because you, know, you solve two problems at once. One is censorship issue. If you get a co-production, co-developed partner in China, you know they, you and he, uh, them is gonna work together to pass the censorship. Yeah. Okay, you both guys putting money into development, and then the other thing is you develop the, the project when you're thinking about how to market in the, you know, w when the film is done. So that's really helpful. And it's especially for independent. I think that's extremely, that's the only method, I think, if you want to get into China, you know, and to work on the market for more than five years. That's the key. Thank you. I'm going to cut you off there and take a couple more questions if we can. There's one over there. Uh, yes. Uh, hi. Hesam uh, Korbanyan. I'm a distributor. Uh, my question is about um, uh, video on demand and the habit of uh, Chinese audience uh, watching independent films online and pay for it. 
if there's any market, and also considering that sometimes there are um, censorship and control over the internet. Um, so just wanted to know that how, how it is in China right now. Thank you. You just hit, keep hitting refresh on the internet, eventually it works. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, this is, um, sounds like a question for me, but you know, I mean, I think uh, right now I'm spending a lot of time trying to reprogramming the internet platform. Okay, I think it is the future because it is target audiences, you know, uh, based. Uh, so I think for independence co-production films, uh, there are, you know, a lot of things. We are buying a lot of independent foreign films for our independent platform. Our, you know, GM for international is here, and I think obviously film that is a bit of was making like the children from Yellowstone and those films, they're not working for, they're not high, high concept films. It's not for mass market. Okay, this is for niche audiences. But internet is the only platform can do that for, you know, to, to, to get a reasonable, you know, streaming or the audience to, to pay for these kind of, you know, independent So you're, you're, pitch films. you're pitching the internet as the, as the, the future the of independent of Independent, fine, we'll take another question. Hi, I just wanted to find out how easy is it to actually film in China in terms of getting like work permits for foreign crews? Do they have crew quotas for Chinese crew, etc.? How the easy is that? In the, the middle piece. Thank you. Good question. You won't be able to shoot in China without China Film Co-production. So you'll have people organize things with you and checking also. Uh, are you organized and what is happening? They, they take care of the visa permit. Uh, it's possible to shoot everywhere because even some Chinese directors are doing illegal, illegal underground films. So, uh, but if, you're, uh, if you have a foreign crew, then it's impossible because you'll be spot right away. They'll know that you're here. <laughs> 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 so you'd better have your permits and have everything on order. <laughs> I think it, in simple order, having shot a few movies there now, um, yes, it's, I think it's, it's definitely possible and they encourage it. They want, they, one of the reasons that they've opened up all this, you know, film activity is to actually encourage more shooting in China. There's nothing more they'd love. But if you don't go through the process of making it a co-production and getting the proper visas and making sure you're employing the right local Chinese and making sure that they're getting trained in the way that, you know, they should be trained from kind of, they want to learn from American filmmaking tactics, you're not going to make your movie or you're going to have problems. Follow um, the rules. We got you. Have to follow yeah. the rules, and they're not hard rules to follow. Yeah, and also you'll get a lot more money if you go and make it a Chinese co-production. You will be allowed to release that movie in China without hitting a quota. I think we have time for one more question. There's whoa, there's lots of questions. There's a microphone over there, and, and then we'll come down the front. We'll do two questions, but make them quick. Uh, hi, uh, Adrian Chang from Hong Kong Trade in Toronto. Hello uh, there. We organize a film mart in Hong Kong every March. Um, my question is, uh, how do you see Hong Kong's role in uh, helping bring North American companies over uh, to help China's uh, uh, film growth overall? Hong Kong as a gateway to China. Jeffrey Chan. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're taping it. <laughs> to get off. No, I'm kidding. Uh, I think... Uh, I think it really depends. I think uh, uh, it's not a must, okay? Then uh, it really depends on uh, uh, each individual or, or uh, each project or each company's situation to make the decision. I would think it's a case or, or, or specific where maybe you find it easier to, to get through Hong Kong, work with a Hong Kong company when you maybe uh, you don't have uh, uh, enough China experience like Mr. Carpenter or or uh, uh, you have a special uh, situ a case situation, a characteristic that you better set up in Hong Kong. I think it's not a must, but uh, 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 it's, it's, uh, 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 it's something you should consider. Uh, or you can go directly work with an uh, uh, experienced Chinese company as well. So, well, I also think Hong Kong, real quick, is just uh, Hong Kong, Shanghai, um, and the UK have become the hubs for people that don't understand China just because it's very difficult, as you hear, to get in with the right people. Um, when you have a new market open, you inevitably have a lot of consultants, and those consultants come and say, I can get you in the right places, just give me $100,000. And after you pay enough for those people $100,000, you realize you're getting totally screwed. 
Um, <laughs> then you go, and there are real people in, that have set up in Hong Kong and in Shanghai and in, in uh, uh, I'm sorry, in um, Singapore uh, and in um, London who use hubs that are close to China to actually help be real consultants and understand the market. And it's also very difficult to get RMB converted to the dollar. Um, and those are the three places that help you do that. Yeah. Yeah, and I just uh, I miss appointed uh, DBS as you know one of the uh, export accounts bank in Singapore, you know, for my next project uh, with uh, with uh, US, and then and also people like Phil Kong, you know, the, those very credit, you know, uh, producers will help you, you know, to get into China, and and so I think financially, and and the staff, the, the professionals are the strengths of. Yeah. I mean, I Hong Kong I, I'm going to take, take this question as well. I mean, I, I think Hong Kong would like to see itself as the gateway, the, like the sole gateway to China. Um, unfortunately, that's not true anymore. Uh, it's one of many gateways. There are, I've seen Korean companies portray themselves as gateways to China, Singaporean companies, uh, Taiwanese companies, uh, and by the way, you can go direct and work with China, uh, Chinese companies yourself. But there are certain skills in, in Hong Kong um, that, that are still valid, and it's, it's, one, it's, it's an important gateway, but it's not the only gateway. Last question, last question, down the front here. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sean Field from Barbados. Uh, I'm owner of Island Boy Films. Um, with regards to co-productions in China, we are a huge buying market in the Caribbean for anything Chinese. And what we're seeing right now is, for example, our, our country just announced a $50 million um, arts <laughs> and, and, and we're <laughs> we've just announced fifty million dollars that China is actually going to help put into our, our arts um, and helping us create an industry. We're an emerging market. How does um, a region like us reach out to you know? As you said, it's very hard. You pay out a hundred thousand dollars to the wrong guy enough times, you get screwed. How do we know the exact direction in which way to go within China, coming from a region that we recognize? You know, you have interest in us, and we have we have similar interests. I think it's really simple, and um, they can probably answer it the same way I would, I would guess, which is go direct. If you go to either, you know, Huasha or you go to the China Film Group, um, you're not going to, they're, they're who you need to go to directly. And if you go to them and say, we want, we have co-production capital, or go to one of the co-production entities that's very powerful, that's made many movies, um, don't put a middleman in between you and them, because you'll end up paying dearly. Um, and if you find anybody that's on this panel clearly has the experience of knowing the right people, and whether it's directly at the government or one level below, you need to be working that closely with them, in my opinion. Great. That's, that's time. Um, thank you very much for being an attentive audience. <laughs>